Hello, everyone. For those of you just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session is the Absurd as a Radical Space for Social Inquiry. I'll turn it over to our moderator, Catherine, to introduce yourself, the panelists, and begin our session. Yes, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm really, really excited. Um, for this panel, The Absurd is Radical Space for Social Inquiry. I'm going to be super brief because I want to have enough time for discussion afterwards. Each panelist is going to briefly discuss their work. Um, we're going to start with Charlotte Kent, who's an assistant Yonders. professor of visual culture in the Department of Art and Design at Montclair State University to give us an overview of the topic as we see it. And we'll move on from there. So Charlotte, take it away. Thank you, Catherine. So, all right. So I've been thinking through the absurd these days, which as a nonsense is the only sense to me. Inevitably in discussing the absurd, people refer back to Camus, the myth of Sisyphus from 1942, and from there to existentialism, nihilism, despair, irony, satire, covering the gamut from Albi to Sesame Street. So what is the absurd? Well, Kierkegaard used the unknowability of life's meaning or God's presence to claim that Christians should renew faith, not through reason, but by virtue of the absurd, that is faith. For Camus, the absurd arises from a confrontation with existential nihilism. Here you are and you will never get what you want, which is to know why on earth you exist. There is probably no reason, just as there is no reason for disease or disaster. You aren't absurd, the world isn't absurd, but when the two meet, absurd. Since Martin Esslin wrote Theater of the Absurd in 1961, using Camus' explanation of the absurd to connect a set of writers, starting with Samuel Beckett, Many presume that the absurd must address the irresolvable conflict of being in a meaningless world. The theater of the absurd though moved to television and advertising to music videos and internet culture, from memes to quantum mechanics, the absurd proliferates these days. But don't worry, it's not all nonsense and nihilism and you won't grow roots waiting for me to get to my point. The absurd isn't about meaninglessness. It's an encounter with the problems and the meanings we've inherited. The truths, the values, the good, the bad, must they be so? Our premises determine our conclusions and keep us stagnant. Must we conserve our logical foundation or can we learn from the paradoxes and change these times? The absurd disrupts. I'm riffing here on Deleuze, Foucault, among a slew of others to explain how the absurd operates as an event. It emerges as an expression that does not correspond or conform to the familiar. It doesn't serve what exists, and so you can't make sense of it. The body's double take when encountering the absurd is the shock of thought moving through you. The inhalation of horror and the exhalation of humor reset time. When the logic of the system falls apart and we jolt at how or why or when that made sense, we're also confronted with a chance opportunity to move in a new direction. That's the absurd. Its ethics, its politics, its expression are a caper into radical inquiry. Now, just as the absurd arose to address how the order of things prior to each and both of the world wars no longer applied, so do many of today's expressions of the absurd make us think about how our understanding and expectations of our world don't work in the new data-driven capitalism, an economy indifferent to two people speaking next to a tree, unless it can quantify them in form and function, classify them in series and sets to extract a current and future value. Our organizations and associations, our techniques and logics, our procedures and practices don't work for a great many people anymore. You are easier to predict than the weather, and a decision tree is your ecosystem. The absurd appears to uproot that ease. The absurd doesn't deny what is. It doesn't project what might be. It appears to make you think. These artists, their projects, sow wild seeds of possibility. And as Samuel Beckett said in the unnameable, questions, hypotheses, call them that, 
keep going, going on, call that going, call that on. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. And next up we have Adam Zaretsky, who is an artist, wet lab art practitioner, and as I've been seeing a playful plunger poet. So Adam, please take it away. I think you're muted, Adam. There we go. All right, so um, yes, I do have the plunger. Um, I'm here to talk about the crazy shape that we are. So in other words, we have all these orifices built into this strange interface, which is our body. And kill it, kill it. Please. Um, so uh, I'm kind of intrigued uh, by our form. Um, and I think that uh, we evolved from probably a single celled organism, right? Some archaic organism. And we somehow got into this shape. And I think that there's some way to absurdly analyze the way that we simply accept the anatomy that we have. Um, in order for, if we're looking for social progress, we might want to reanalyze what we think we are. Um, so we have this sort of like bilateral symmetry. I think you can see this look. I look like a gila monster. So we have two eyes and two nostrils and a mouth. And there's sort of a line that goes down the middle of our body. And you can see we can do sort of yoga, symmetrical yoga. But generally, people go for upper body and face, and they leave the lower body out. Um, and at the same time, if we were to superimpose the face with the genitals, we would find that we're not just bilaterally symmetrical, but we're also transversally symmetrical. For instance, if I were to go like this, you can sort of see that my elbows and my knees have something in common, which means that my head and my genitals also are probably anatomically related. That's a lot to handle. And when I wrote a letter to a bunch of people that study human embryology and developmental biology, um, and I asked them, what is the relation of the ovaries and the testicles to the eyes? And is it really obvious or not that this is our anus, right? We don't want to talk about it. And there are no words, right? I think you're starting to feel that. But when we first were fertilized, we broke into two and then we broke into four. And right around the eight cell stage, we got up, down, left, right, and front and back. And then after that, there's sort of like, there's a relationship, almost a numerological or Kabbalistic relationship to this. Um, uh, thank you, Connor. I have kids, sorry. So. One of the things I did to prepare myself for this was I've made an interactive or official economy suit for the future of virtuality so that we wouldn't just have a virtual face, but we would be able to connect like plug and play our nipples to other people's anuses and other people's, you know, like urethras to our ears and have some sort of interface between everyone's orifices with everyone else's. And I think that's sort of important. Um, I don't know. I think it's somewhat ornate but I also think that it's somewhat censored. And this is a strange thing. Um, I don't know if you can relate to this, but we started sort of like this, this segmented worm, right? A tube, and these are actual vagaries. Ugh, how do I say it? These are strange or official um, developmental specialties. And I don't know how to read us. So I thought I'd put it forward that we have trouble reading ourselves. And one of the reasons is because we're ignoring our lower bodies and we're trying to focus on the mind. Uh, now, when you're an anatomist, it's not unusual to make imagery of testicles, et cetera, but it's really unusual to me is that no one superimposes the eyes and the ovaries. So I sort of tried to do this for you here. Um, What's most important to me is that 
how do I say, this is um, about perception as well, right? So um, I'm interested in what does it mean to have the organs that we do have? And also what does it mean to have organs that change over time? So in other words, if we were one directional, maybe we were up and down and we became this way, you should be able to take a quarter of my body right here and sort of extrapolate it out one way and then another way so that one quarter of your body equals your full body four times. That's strange, but I don't know. I've been I'm, studying. What's I'm that? sorry, Adam, we're at five minutes and I know oh. that's not a lot of time, but hopefully we'll get back to it in the questions and the conversation. Can I, can I wrap with something about blind yeah. fish? Okay, sure. so strangely, there's these fish that live in caves and they went blind because there is no light, but their eyes leaked out like tears and dripped down the sides of their face. And now they're born with these organs that hang off the side of their face that can sort of sense something other than light. So there's vestigial organs dripping in the blind fish in the caves. On to next, here we go. Excellent, thank you. Um, next, we have Arustiak Gabriellen, who's a speculative designer from Foreground Design Agency. Thank you. All right. Share the screen. That was fascinating. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm a speculative designer working with biological materials, natural systems, and atmospheric phenomena. And my work aims to torque our imaginaries to help us rethink our interactions uh, with both human and non-human agents on this planet. Today, I'll share with you a recent design prototype called Post-Human Habitats, which is from an ongoing series titled Near Extinction Rituals, which catalyze or require for survival new rituals that force humans out of their exploitative relationship with the more than human world and obligate them to collaborate and thus co-evolve towards more inclusive and ethical models for living. The ways in which this work connects to the theme of the absurd is that while these design prototypes work, they offer no practical solutions to what, were, what are dream, uh, deemed intractable problems, but rather they propose a radical alternative to the ways in which we exist in the world and the ways in which we interact and relate to one another, human or otherwise. The project is essentially a wearable farm intended to provide sustenance to the wearer as well as flourish as an expanding ecosystem that attracts and integrates other animal and insect life. Here, bodily systems and plant ecologies are symbiotic. The material of landscape, its moisture, weight, vitality becomes a second skin, one that both insulates and unifies our bodies with the living world in which we are, we're immersed. The act of dressing oneself in living matter becomes part of the landscape experience whereby we lose our sense of discrete self and become one with our habitational field in a kind of transcorporeality with the living world. Here you're seeing the trophic levels involved in the process of food production. Most primary are the photosynthesizers or plants, including the herbs, berries, vegetables, legumes that require sun and water as inputs. The second and third trophic levels of organisms are essential for the breakdown of organic matter, and these include bacteria, fungi, and nematodes. And the high-level predators of the fourth and fifth trophic levels are largely composed of pollinators, which are essential to the regeneration of the system, and those include insects, rodents, and birds. The recycling of wastes is essential to the perpetuation of these habitats, which activate the digestive and renal systems of the body. The plants themselves convert carbon dioxide into sugar and oxygen through photosynthesis. Urine is collected uh, and filtered using a process of forward osmosis developed by NASA and used to irrigate the plants to provide the base for the system to thrive. Organic matter becomes compost as it is processed by worms and other insects. The manure of small animals that occupy the system additionally fertilize the crops. And finally, the dead organisms provide food for pollinators and contribute to the humus layer. The system is made from moisture retention felt used in green, uh, green wall technology, fabric-based green wall technology. Though this felt system has been used prolifically to create vertical gardens throughout the world, its potential for garmenting the body and feeding the world's human and non-human population has yet to be explored. These assemblages are not intended to be closed ecosystem, 
ecosystems, but are open to external input and disturbance, particularly through essential pollinators that introduce new species into the garments and create unexpected hybrids. As you may know, a third of our food is pollinator dependent and pollinators are slowly disappearing from this earth. So the project additionally safeguards their survival. Food is the composite web of the technical, ethical, cultural, and effective. It is also the material embodiment of an incredibly complex but largely invisible assemblage of trophic encounters between different living species. Yet humans have intellectually positioned themselves outside the food chain, despite being host to millions of microbial organisms that are both nourished by our interiors and exteriors and are essential to our survival. The project asks how we as geocentric subjects and especially our bodies could feed more than just our kin. The project additionally instigates new social rituals around the collective harvesting and sharing of food. It's the ultimate farm to table or really body to mouth experience. Communal meals require collective harvests and the location of ingredients on the bodies of others. The practice of the harvest becomes re-ritualized as a collective act of labor and a celebration of a closer relationship between acts of production and consumption. Yet rather than a nostalgic desire to return to the natural economies of pre-industrial societies, these projects speculates on food production in the new planetary landscape of depleted soils and the increasing threat of food insecurity. We collectively ingest the shared harvest, binding us together in a secular act of communion. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have interdisciplinary artist, Carla Gamas. No way. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? And you can hear me okay? All right. Hi everyone, it's great to see you all virtually. And um, my approach to the absurd originates in the American South where I spent the first 22 years of my life. I'm going to begin by showing some older artworks to provide a bit of context for what I make today. Here are two pieces from the mid 2000s, both featuring Roy and his trophy wife. I've been either a pescatarian or a vegetarian since I was 15, but oh boy, when you grow up in a place where hunting and pageant culture are glorified, it can leave an indelible mark on you. Growing up in a small Southern town in the middle of the Bible Belt provides a lot of fodder for absurdity and satire. The works of Southern Gothic writers like William Faulkner, Flannery O'Connor, and Zora Neale Hurston attest to that. Okay, so what I'm about to share with you, well, there's not an image I want to attach to it. I haven't shown my Southern Gothic work in some time. For years, I tried to escape any identification with the South at all. But we are at a tipping point in America across the US, not just in the Southern states, and we are all having to come to terms with the fact that some people still today fervently abide by the absurd premise that the color of one's skin indicates supremacy. The town I lived in between ages nine and 18 was the site of a racially motivated murder that occurred in 1970. Three white men killed an African-American man who they accused of speaking to one of their wives. These men went to trial and were acquitted by an all-white jury. As a result, there was a renewal of civil rights actions, including protests and riots in the town. Now, I didn't find out about this event until 2004, when Timothy Tyson's book, Blood Done Sign My Name, was published revealing in detail this horrifying history. Unfortunately, this is not a unique event for back then or now. At the time, I could not find any justifiable way to address my feelings about the incident directly through my art. These are a few works I produced in the following years that reference the antebellum South and a nation's continuing denial of its history. So just two more old works. The image on the right is of a robot defacing a Confederate monument. I'd begun to think at the time about what other forms of oppression could occur in the future. Perhaps this robot is filled with abhorrence towards the symbol of oppression. Okay, now we're in the present. And what you're looking at here are new robot prototypes I've been working on over the past few years, inspired by the eccentric mannerist painter Archimbaldo. These characters, however, are not comprised of organic fruits and vegetables, but of their digital signifiers, emoji and meme and memes. You may be scratching your head about my claim that these are robots, but is it any more absurd than this all white robot representation of our future? Now, back to my band of ridiculous robots. 
Here's Lady Ava interface named in honor of Lady Ava Lovelace, the first computer programmer. And she took over the Whitney's website, that's Lady Ava interface, during 30 seconds of sunrise and sunset for six months. Lucille Trackball represents an AI comedian, and they do many of their comedy performances in AR and VR, beginning with the absurd premise that a female identified robot can be funny. Lucille takes on topics like class stratification, tech ageism, and robot love. Oliver and Mora took selfies in Times Square during August 2018, three minutes every night at midnight. And the gang is all here together in my most recent project entitled Wonder Camera. This is the VR portion of the project and including here are Tipu, the cat meme decolonizer, Victoria, the librarian, and my avatar Carla Gann, cross-platform avatar for recursive life action generative adversarial network. I'll end with the Garden of Emoji Delights, my emojification of Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights. As you'll see, I took some license in the animation. A falling speedboat and plane destroys paradise. The central panel, Earth in the age of the Anthropocene, is depopulated of humans and animals. And in the right panel, hell freezes over. An homage to Robert Frost, quote, some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if I had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. Trying to get to my last slide. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, Carla. And last but not least, we have Jenks Archive, which is Jessica Langley and Ben Kinsley. They are interdisciplinary artists um, and I want to note winners of the new Redline Insight Grant for another project of theirs, The Yard, which I encourage you to check out for its potential of everyday absurdity as well. So take it away, Ben and Jen. All right, um, I'm going to share the screen. Can you see and can you see that and hear us? All right. <clears throat> So I'm Ben Kinsley. I'm Jessica Laley. And we're representing, we're two thirds of Jenks Archive along with our collaborator, Jerston Crosby, who couldn't be here today. Um, since 2012, we've been working on a collaborative project with Jerston, seen here, called Jenks Archive. It's an archive of insult humor from around the world. We collect jokes that one person would say directly to another to insult them in a playful, humorous, or clever way. And we like to think of this project as an experimental documentary investigating an oral tradition. So Jerston grew up calling these types of put down jokes, janks, and he was surprised to learn that we had never heard this word before because he had assumed that this was the word for this type of joke. Um, he could also recall a number of janks that were very different in style and subject than what we remembered from childhood. Jerston is from Alabama, um, while the two of us grew up in different parts of Ohio. So some questions emerged from this exchange. Is this insult joke tradition universal human behavior? Um, do the terms used to describe this ritual differ from place to place, even within the same country or language? And are the types of jokes, insults, types of jokes or insults site specific to place or region, like in terms of format, theme, or subject? Um, and what can be learned about a culture through what is considered insulting? So we decided to begin a worldwide collection of janks. So we created a definition and we established a rule about what we archive and what we don't. To be considered a jank, the joke needs to be intended to directly insult another person in a face-to-face -face interaction. These jokes can attack personal attributes like physical appearance, intelligence, socioeconomic status, interpersonal relationships, but they can't be directed at large groups of people or anyone who is not physically present at the time. We do not want to document or perpetuate racist, sexist, bigoted humor, However, many good janks push the limits of acceptable topics, cultural taboos, and importantly, our own comfort zones. This quote by philosopher Simon Critchley sums it up nicely. If you can work out the patterns of joke telling in a society, you can work out how that society functions. <coughs> Since 2012, we've traveled to 16 cities and nine countries documenting oral traditions of insult humor. Our collections take different forms, but usually it involves canvassing passersby on the street and asking them to tell us jokes on camera. 
as well as any other information they can give us about the joke, like who told it to them and what context and anything else that will help us understand its meaning because humor often doesn't translate. And we add all of this info um, into a web archive, which is categorized by location, subject, and keyword, which you can browse on our website, jenksarchive.org. We also experiment with ways of interpreting and representing this content. We do this through museum and gallery exhibitions, um, video installations, public text works, billboards, and murals, um, as well as publications. Um, on the left is a, a zine that we produced for um, a conference, um, which is a collection of a lot of readings. And then on the right um, is illustrated versions um, of different janks from the archive. We also produce a podcast called Don't Spit, Can't Swim, which dives deeper into specific jokes and cultural, cultural traditions. The more places we collect, the more variations of this type of humor emerge and the more interesting and deep this project becomes for us. This has led to a lot more formal research in subjects ranging from anthropology and linguistics to philosophy and mythology. Insults are an ancient oral tradition with inherent ties to human social evolution. The theory is that once human, early humans formed into groups, to better their chances of survival, they needed to establish a social hierarchy. This was initially done through displays of physical strength, but as our brains developed and became an important asset, battles of wit emerged, and the true display of mental agility is not in the initial attack or the insult, but the quick-witted response, the repartee. So this is where some scholars believe the tradition of insult duels originate, but this tradition persists, and the idea is that while the intention appears at first to be antagonistic, janks are in fact an integral aspect of human interaction used as much to strengthen camaraderie as to establish dominance. So it's really about the exchange, and this is something anthropologists refer to as joking relationships. Oops. Where is my... okay. um, <clears throat> we have a lot more to say about all of this, but for now we'll end with a quote by Geneva Smitherman and a scholar of Afri African-American English um, about the tradition of the dozens, which if you don't know, is a game of insult duels common in black communities in the United States. The disses are purely ceremonial, which creates a safety zone. Like it's not personal, it's business. In this case, um, the business of playing on and with the world. Thanks. Thank you. Let me get out of this somehow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. I, that was great. Um, I'm going to open it up for questions in the document, and um, let's see. I think the first question um, is from Fanny, and it's, could you talk more to the use of the absurd by feminist movements, if any? And does anybody, does that latch on for anyone? And then the second question, while you're thinking about the uses of feminism, and I'm really interested in the absurd as a, as a potential for Marxist materialist feminism um, is David, and I think they mean Adam, you have to tell us more about the fishes. <laughs> Cut you off when you were talking about the vestigial tears. And I think, I think the audience wants to hear a little bit more about that as well. So if anyone wants to jump in on how does this have applications for the feminist movement, which is definitely something near and dear to my heart, um, as are those vestigial tears of those fishes. Thoughts on that? Well, I'll just jump in on the feminism question for a moment. I mean, I think if we take the premise of feminism to be the questioning of a set of social and political structures and how they have created a society that is based on imbalance and inequality, um, the absurd challenges us to really think through these things we take for granted and how it is that we're operating in systems that when we actually take a moment to look at them, when we just think them through for that split second, we realize they don't actually work in the way they claim to. And so in that sense, I mean, you know, this is one of the arguments around humor too, but what I think is interesting about 
you know, the absurd in particular is also its aspect of horror, right? It's that you, it's not easy like humor. There's also this aspect of it that's challenging and upsetting. And for me, at least, it's that moment of the upsetting that is where you get stopped to be able to think through what just happened. I don't know if anyone else wants to. I think on that note, and we'll get to the fishes, I'm sorry, Adam. I think that's a really good segue to another question um, for Jenks, which is how come these Jenks aren't funny is the question we got. Um, well, that's a great question. Um, I mean, attempting to explain why jokes are funny, which is what we do in this project, renders them unfunny. And I think that that's, you know, part of uh, kind of how we embrace absurdity. Um, and then also, you know, in relation to what Charlotte was just mentioning in terms of um, like feminism and, and how humor is easy. And I think that, you know, there's this tradition of the um, maternal insult and um, dating, you know, goes back a long way, um, insulting where you came from, um, your mother. And, um, you know, I think that by kind of analyzing and collecting and then representing things um, in our video installation as well, like the reactions are often like very complex because I think we, it, you know, it forces you to not only interpret or try to make sense of the actual combination of words, um, but then, you know, how these things relate to um, culture at large and, um, why, you know, why are we, why are we laughing at these concepts and, um, yeah, and I think something with the maternal insult anyway is, is the idea is that, well, so a lot of cultures in terms of profanities, cultures tend to form their profanities around concepts that they fear. In uh, Dutch language, a lot there's a lot of um, disease related profanities, like COVID related uh, 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 profanities are starting to be inc incorporated into Dutch language now. But I think the same thing goes with humor and you're playing with taboos and you're also playing with um, kind of putting down the sacred, right? And so I think one way to think about like a yo mama joke or, or maternal insults is that you're actually insulting something very sacred, right? You're insulting the mother, you're insulting uh, a sacred person in, in, in a community. So I think that like Charlotte said, I think sometimes it's, it's almost the inverse uh, of what you are hearing and what the meaning really comes from. I mean, that has now spiraled maybe out of control, but I think that that's maybe if you dig back to the beginning, the origin, that might be where that's coming from. Um, and again, to talk about the why these jokes aren't funny, we are translating from various languages and we decided at one point to not try to find the equivalent, but to go with the direct translation. So a lot of these just do not work. Out. Like you hear in the video, the original language, and if you speak that language, you might laugh but and understand the context and the play on words. But uh, when it's just translated to text, it also it morphs its meaning. And we did a mural recently that's called, that says push the ship that we showed in Raleigh. And uh, Jurston did the mural and it's really interesting because he starts thinking about it now as like, we can actually accomplish something impossible. It's almost like a positive, uh, uh, you know, cheer, cheer as opposed to what it comes from. I think that one was Lithuanian. And it's about, it's like to say, it's kind of buzz off, uh, go do something that is it's impossible. impossible. Yeah. <clears throat> maybe, I, maybe I can jump in here, is that okay? Um, so to start with, with the feminist thing, I'm studying transgenic humans and human anatomy and human development and embryology and malformation and a lot of the transgenic human embryos that are out there, most of them are not born, but some have been born, um, are sort of perpetrated as part of new reproductive um, technology as a sort of um, act, I think, deeply misogynistic. Not that all IVF is misogynistic, but the process of surrogacy for experimental babies and the idea that these plasmids or these this thing around my head, this halo, the CRISPR, constructs are not detrimental to the human genome, which they are. In fact, they're, they're missing the point. These people are making really absurdist sculptures 
out of the human genome. They're actually making a fine joke on uh, cut up. Um, on the other hand, I do think that these images of the development from a non descript semi genital into like a vagina or a penis need to be reframed uh, because first of all, this is great. This is our original um, hybrid, what do you call it? This is our original hermaphroditic moment, right? Where our tail is coming back into our body and we have both a vagina and a penis. And I think the language of this becoming sexed has to be um, reanalyzed. Um, obviously, I think it needs to be reanalyzed as far as like people that are anatomically trans as well as identity trans and what the difference is. And it's a really difficult nomenclature because this is what is expected, which is like your face and either testicles or ovaries. And it's not always the case, but that's not also the definition of your gender being. Um, as far as these, these fish, oh, wow. Yes, it's true. They live in caves. Their eyes just, they became blind after a while. And people study this. They, a lot of people study this because they're developmental biologists, but they want to go caving. And so they decide, I'm going to go caving and study these fish that live in a puddle. There's only like 300 of them on earth and they're blind. And they go and they take one a year and they kind of look at it. But it turned out that the eyes devolved, right? Because they weren't being used. They became archaic. They became failure. And instead of becoming failure, that's chaos. They sort of, the genes for the eyes dripped out, but then off the cheeks of the fish now hang these tears of melted eyeballs that have the neurological use value that they need in the cave. They replace their eyes with some other, some other organ, but it's obscure. What all I want to put forward um, before passing the mic is that we are also obscure that we are anatomically obscure and we forget. So what the image I wanna leave you with is a tube with Ikebana sticking out of both ends. Okay, you know Ikebana, the Japanese flower arrangements. This is my flower arrangement here. And if I had the balls, I would pull down my pants and show you that I've drawn eyeballs on them. And I just yank them up over my penis. And then you can see that the tip of my nose was the tip of your clitoris or the tip of your cock. And, and it would become quite clear to you. That's all for now. Thank you. Um, so this is from Anonymous. With the heated context around the Black Lives Matter movement, have you seen a change in the way white people use the absurd? And are you changing the way that you use it? Um, would anyone else like to uh, oh, respond to that? Um, I think since uh, we are kind of right in the middle of this, I know personally, I haven't felt um, like I could even make art, <laughs> you know, uh, in response to it. And there's a lot of, of learning and listening that I think is required because I think there were, you know, historically in the United States, and I think you know, given the worldwide uh, protests, um, there are certain assumptions we've made in terms of progress or um, certain blind spots, right? And um, so, you know, dealing with the absurd, that's why I showed some older work today, right? Which I think is flawed, of course. For example, you know, a, a robot defacing a, a Confederate monument today, you know, I wish I'd made her toppling it over, right? A more forceful, you know, message. And I, and, and I, I think right now, given the seriousness of, you know, the events that are going on, it's hard for me, at least, to, um, because it's, it is incredibly absurd, but it also, you know, is the cost of human lives. And so I think, you know, at least personally, I am needing to take some time um, to reconsider, you know, my own approaches and, um, and what is um, even in terms of my positionality as a white person, you know, what territory do I address and what is not mine to, you know, speak to? Arusiak, yeah. Um, in my work, um, an excellent question. In my work, I think what I try to highlight and 
what's uh, important to keep in mind is that all the kind of uh, systems of oppression, be it white supremacy, be it um, imperialism, capitalism, patriarchy, uh, and our attitudes towards the biophysical world are all interconnected. And these are issues that are in play and systems that are in play in everything that we do. And so in my work, I try to destabilize uh, in some of these, um, and, but to highlight that these are all kind of in interconnected and to highlight that link between how we treat the biophysical world and how we treat each other as, as humans. So it's an excellent question, um, but it, it is pervasive and it's in, in every system of oppression that you, one can identify really. Uh, these, these kind of structures. Yeah, and on that note, there's another, oh, it got deleted. There's another question for you, Arusiak, which I think was, um, do you have any plans on, um, oh, it, it came back. Also, um, could Adam hear us all laughing and clapping just now? So that was for you, Adam. Everyone just really liked your balls on balls on balls. Um, Arusiak, sorry. Um, are there plans for creating the living matter dresses on the larger scales? And what are the economics and challenges of a global application of that project? Yes, well, it, it's, it's interesting. Every time I show the project, um, because it functions, uh, it, it works. That we, we were able to grow 22 different crops. Each cloak produced about 20 pounds of crop uh, produce. That's enough to feed a family of three for three weeks or to make 200 of those bowls of um, fresh vegetables from Whole Foods that you might buy. So it works as a prototype, but it's not intended to be um, a, a, a thing that's uh, you know, a, a solution uh, for our uh, food crises, um, or it was never imagined on kind of a large scale. Uh, and, and so it, it's funny, the reactions that people get because it works is that they assume that this is a, uh, uh, a kind of product that could be sold and could be used to uh, deal with our food crisis. Um, but, uh, but it's really intended to have us question um, our relationship with the biophysical world. Um, it's, it's meant to probe at our uh, kind of increasing food insecurity issues uh, by rethinking how we can coexist with uh, living uh, species in the future and how we can kind of co-create to, to kind of lend our bodies as a habitat to the creatures that help us grow our food uh, is, is, is basically the main concept. But it is an interesting thing to consider if this was on a mass scale, uh, the kind of uh, life it would have that's slightly different than at the body scale, which, is, which has been my focus. Definitely something to prod further. Yeah, definitely. Um, we have about eight minutes left and I wanna make sure to get to all the really good questions they have a lot in common. So I'm gonna do something kind of obnoxious and throw them all out and then just let everyone talk for the next um, seven, eight minutes. Um, the questions are, what are ways in which absurdity can spark social change? Which is a big question Charlotte and I have for this project overall. Um, how might radical exchange be absurd? And then um, a comment previously from Maria, Maria Elena, says, um, she says that her work uses the absurd centrally, but as a way to incorporate traumatized and alienated workers and indigenous voices from the effects of imperialisms and access to cultural capital and discourse and art. Um, this speaks to me again, because I see the absurd as a way forward for those who don't have the luxury of giving up um, or the luxury of having faith. So does anyone have any comments on that as the absurd for um, maybe radical space for social change or um, for humor within that as well. Well, I'll just, well, I think Jessica is gonna say something but just, I couldn't quite tell. I mean, I was just gonna say one of the things that I thought was remarkable yesterday in the um, opening keynote by Audrey Tang was when she mentioned um, the way in which in Taiwan they've instituted something called humor, not rumor. And it's the way they're countering fake news. And so basically one of the things is they, they track um, these you know, conspiracy theories and like misinformation that's getting spread um, across social media and different types of websites and sources. And as soon as they encounter it, they start to create these memes and they start to create um, a response to it and they use 
you know, government ministers and homonyms and they use like all, all the, tra they traffic in the visual culture of memes to resist the type of misinformation that's being spread often to enhance the power or the position of a particular person or a group or whatever. And it's their way of addressing the fact that actually through their memes, they can really quickly alter the social misunderstandings that are happening. And so it's not exact, I mean, depending on the individual memes, they're not necessarily absurd. They can just be sort of jokes or puns or whatever. But I just wanted to throw that out there as a way in which I think it is important to present the way how we can use the absurd to respond to, especially in the United States right now, what is so painfully evident, which is the vast amount of misinformation and conspiracy theories that are out there, and that how do we respond to them since argument and logic doesn't. We have a couple of things we'd like to share, if that's, were you done, Mr. Trout? Sorry. Um, so we just have notes and lots of research from reading about humor and the power, like the possible uh, critical functions of humor, right? Um, um, yeah, so um, Simon Critchley writes about how in laughing at power, you bury power. And um, the best humor can change the situation. So it, rem it, um, it rem renders the familiar unfamiliar, um, turning the real to surreal or the ordinary to extraordinary. And um, in terms of folk humor. Yeah, like Bakhtin's concept of carnival the temporary liberation from established order, I think is really in interesting here. And the idea, or Bechtin talks about folk humor as the means to say something that is conventionally unsayable, right? So it's a way to, um, uh, he talks about folk humor has always existed, but has never merged with the official culture of the ruling class, right? Um, and these transgressions serve as a device of freedom that liberates uh, their creative energies. And I just think there's some really interesting ways of thinking about like the, the, the unsayable, the taboo, uh, the things that, that exist in culture that are not part of the formal culture, right? Um, and I think that relates also a little bit to the idea of like tricksters and mythology and folklore. Um, tricksters are these characters that disobey rules and conventional behavior. They uncover and disrupt they provide space for cultures to explore their own limitations and they play with the edge of what is accepted and what is possible. So I think in terms of thinking about the possibility of absurdity or humor, I think, I think of these ideas. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, so yeah, you know, when we picture this giant mural leading up to the White House that says Black Lives Matter on the street or in Seattle and you get these shots, I mean, like the notion of that, like to imagine that is absurd, but it's, it's this, um, it's this beautiful like possibility that someone has shown us, or these muralists. Yeah, I just am very into the "Who's Next" dancing on fallen monuments meme right now. That upset <laughs> went from these suburban kids just annoying their parents to now dancing on fallen um, imperialist statues. This, this "Who's Next," and you should only be afraid of it if you're next. Yeah, I think memes are really, really important to discuss right now. And that was another question. Um, we have two minutes. Any final thoughts? Adam? Oh, you sure, absolutely. Show us your, you know I'm always game. Show um, us your... uh, so here's, here's a couple of little things. Um, first of all, I was looking at um, the Words That Sell book, which is really good because we can talk about things that are incomparable and highest quality and fitness, the fittest, the greatest, the what outshines and outranks. I'm, I'm, I write a lot about um, eugenics in terms of biology and population genetics having replaced race in science because of how badly science performed their race games in history has sort of brought us to this point where now it's just about migratory tribes out of Africa 100,000 years ago, there was only 10,000 of us and we're all that related and that's really good. Um, but when I sent this sort of letter about um, the human anatomy to a bunch of like biologists and evolutionary biologists, developmental biologists, at the end, it said, you know, like, 
is there any way to get rid of this guy? Wasn't this list supposed to be not for people like this? And I think we're talking about how the absurd um, reshapes things. Science is very serious about their aura and their brand. And their brand is rationalist and it's a traditional and at the same time new and high fidelity. And their, their words that sell are really basic. But we, I think when trying to point out bias, when trying to point out myths, um, when you engage at the place where the, the brand is most serious, when you actually approach, uh, you know, approach the bench and go like big raspberry, which I think we're all doing, it's, there is this effect, the emperor has no clothes kind of thing. And, and that's our, sorry, that's our time, but I think is a very good absurdist way to be at our time. So everyone to you. Thank you all for joining us. This was absolutely <laughs> wonderful. I'm just honored to be in the same virtual space with you all. Thank you so much. And this was really great. So thank you. Thank you all <laughs> Take care. so much. Take care.